Turn your Bible to the book of Mark. Mark, the last chapter, and the last two verses. Mark chapter 16. In these two verses, we will learn a principle in the Bible. There is a principle in the Bible that we will see, and this principle will direct us through our message today. This will help us through our message today. Mark chapter 16, verse 19 and verse 20. There is the biblical principle for God's people to learn, to abide by. And if you are living in this time and you're not fixing your eyes on the signs of the time, you will be lost. I don't have a mouth of condemnation. My wish is for you and I to go where? To be with Jesus. But there are conditions for us to fulfill. Do you believe that? And there are way marks that we must look upon. If we, if you are going to a place that you don't know yet, what do you use to get there? You use a GPS. Now, now it is easy for us to go anywhere in America. But you remember when people used to use the big maps? The, the husband is driving and the wife is reading the maps? You see how, how difficult this was? And the letters are very small. But the one needed to look at these waymarks because they need to go where they need to go. Now God is making it easier for us. Easier. Why? Because we have the experience of the Israelite that we can follow. The same thing, the same way it is easier now to follow direction through our cell phones. We're going to learn this principle today. It's, it says, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven <clears throat> and sat on the right hand of God. The principle is in verse 20. It says, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word of God with signs following. What is the principle? When they are preaching the word of God, they are using signs, way marks, to confirm the word of God. If it was important for the disciples to preach like that, to educate their audience that it is needed to follow the signs of the end of time, it is, also, is it also important for us to do the same thing? Mostly we are living at the end of time. It is even more important for us to have our eyes where? Fixed on the way marks found in the Bible. Now I'm about to show you that even, the, even John the Baptist used to use way marks to preach the gospel and to bring people to repentance. And this is why his message was different than of the Pharisees. Turn your Bible in the book of Mark, Matthew, Matthew chapter 3. Turn your Bible in the book of Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. It says, verse 2, 3, and 4, it says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, repent he, for the kingdom of heaven is what? Is at hand. For this is what was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare he the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Was he preaching prophecy? Was he showing the way marks of the first coming of Jesus? Did his ministry now had great result, have great result? Yes. Let's read verse 5 and verse 6. It says, Then went out him, Jerusalem, 
all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sin. Look at this. He says, the life of John, brethren, was not spent in idleness. In aesthetic gloom or in selfish isolation. For those who think they have to go and hide into the country and not working for the Lord and showing people the way marks of the second coming of Christ, John the Baptist did not live in isolation. Then it says, from time to time he went forth to mingle with men. He and he was ever and interested observers of what was passing in the world. Let's stop here. Let's stop here now. Let's go. For from his quiet retreat, he watched the unfolding of events. What does that mean, brethren? What does that mean? Talk to me. He used current events, also watch of the unfolding of the events of the world, not only to confirm him of the first coming of Jesus Christ, but also to preach the message to his audience. Should we now, living at the end of time, do the same thing as John the Baptist? Looking at the last event of earth history and now put them in our mind, compare them, or link them with Bible verses and not preach the gospel to those who are lost? Shouldn't we do the same thing, brethren? You're not with me. I can, I can. You have to answer me, brethren. That's exactly what he did. Even Jesus counseled the people to do the same. And he did it in the form of a reproach, brethren. In the form of a reproach. Let's go to Matthew now. In Matthew 24. In Matthew 24. Let's go verse 6 and verse 8. Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 6 and verse 8. Let's see how Jesus now. Jesus said to his disciples that they have to look for the end of time. Even though when they went and asked him, what are the signs of the end of time? Jesus had a plethora of signs to tell them to look for. Let's go to Matthew now. Matthew 24, verse 6 to verse 8, it says, And he shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that he be not, what, brethren? Not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is yet, is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. And all these are what? The beginning, the beginning of sorrow. Let's get a second witness. Let's go to Luke chapter 21. You know it. Verse 20. 1, 25 to 27, Jesus will say that man's heart will, will do what? Will fall. Fear. Let's go. Look 21 now. Look 21, verse 25, and he says, And there shall be sign in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and open the earth distress of nation with perplexities, the sea and the waves, warring men's heart, failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming, coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be what, brethren? Shall be shaken. Now, there is a startling quotation in the book of Patriarch and Prophets, page 537 paragraph 1. Let's read it together. And what I'm going to do with this, with this quotation is to divide it and to show you how this, this quotation is being fulfilled. It says now, the, the, the present 
is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Are you a living being? So what should you do? Look at the present or look at current events. Then it says, brethren, rulers and statemen, men who occupy a position of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes have their attention where? Fix upon the event taking place about us. Look at this now. Are these men, are, are these major, are the, are the majority, is the, is the, the majority of these men, are they converted or hidden? They are hidden. But the Bible says they have their eyes fixed upon the way marks of this earth. And then God's people, they don't want to do it. What a shame is this? What a shame is this? And let me tell you something. When they are looking at the event, at the current events of this, of this world, they are not doing it to bring us better days. Are they? No. It says now, they are watching the relations that exists among the nations. Then they observe the intensity that is taking pos pos possession on every earthly element, and they recognize that something great is decisive, and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Men of this world, they are watching the world and they know that something will happen. Now let me divide this quotation into three. And I'm going to show you current event confirming this. The first one. Look at this now. What is the first one? The first one, it says, rulers in statement, men who occupy position in trust and authority, Thinking men and women of classes have their attention fixed upon the event taking place about us. Look at this, brethren. It says now, less of everything IMF predict darkening out outlook for the world's economy as new normal begins. Inflation, is it something current? Inflation? Inflation, is it current? How much you pay for gas? It was almost $5 six months ago. Inflation, strains on food and energy supplies. War in the Ukraine. Rising jobless numbers along risk of global recession. These are just a few of the factors making a new normal Citing by International Monetary Fund, Director Kristalina Georgieva, Georgieva on Thursday, just, just recently, on Thursday, October 7th, 2022, on Thursday, as darkening the outlook of the world's economy. Shock after shock will cause a global output Loss of four trillion by 2026. Are they looking at the events of the world? Are they looking? Are they, are they looking? Are they taking notes? Why are we not doing the same thing? Then it says, brethren. Then it says, Georgieva one adding the IMF has downgraded economic growth projections to 3.2% for 22, 20, 2022 and 2.9% for 2023. In a Georgetown University speech ahead of the fund's annual meetings next week, George Eva said there was, there was been a fundamental shift in the global economy from, from a world 
of relative predictability to a world with more fragility and greater uncertainty. How does she know that if she's not watching the events of the world? How does she know that? She must have statistics. Men reporting data to her. And for her to have them on her desk. And by compiling them, she's seeing that there is something that, will ha- that is happening to the world. And God gives us the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, five books and nine testimonies for us to study. And then a plethora of books that are not printed that we can still find in the internet. And we don't want to read them. Brethren, it says, it says, in less than three years, in less than three years, 2022, 2025, we, no, no, excuse me. She said, in less than three years, we live through shock after shock after shock. These shocks have inflicted unmeasurable harm on people's lives. Their combined impact is driving a global surge on prices, especially on food and energy, causing a cost of living crisis. Let me go back. Then it says, they are watching the relation that exists among the nations. The present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. But look at this now. It says, where is the G7 headed? Do you recognize anyone this on the, on the picture? I see Biden. I see Mark Macron. And others there. It's called the G7. Look at this now. It says, the G7 is an informal block of industrialized democracies. The United States, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and the United Kingdom that meet annually, annually to discuss issues on global economic governance, international security, and energy policy. Every single year, methodically they do it. Have you stopped one day with your family? Or do you do it annually to make a an overview of your life, of your spiritual life. G7 reached an, a historic agreement ahead of its 2021 summit to overhaul the global rules for corporate taxation, the relation between nations, the G7. Do you see all the head of the nations there? Do you see them? You're not with me. So are they looking at the relationship of the nations? The relationship of the nations. Then it says, then it says, more recently, the G7 has imposed coordinated sanction on Russia. The relation between nations. Why? Because Russia went to war with what? With who? With Ukraine. It says, it says, in response to its war in Ukraine, these men are watching the relation among nations. You know, this is this also, this quotation is also in last day event. That's among the last day events. Then it says, brethren, the group also launched a major global infrastructure program to counter China Belt and Road Initiative. They control the world and the relation between nations. You can read, read it. I have it. Okay? Because I don't want my time to, to, slip, to, to slide on me. Look at this now. Let's go back. Then it says, then it says they observe the intensity that is taking possession on every earthly element. And now it says that the world is on the verge of a stupidious crisis. Look at this, the last current event here. It says, look at this, this is, this is uh, a video. 
2020 was the year that for many normality stopped. The COVID-19 pandemic meant many factories and offices across the world closed, commuters stayed at home and airports were largely empty as the global air networks were reduced to skeleton schedules. You might think the resulting drop in carbon emissions had a discernible effect on the environment. It didn't. The year which saw the largest ever wildfires in California and Colorado and global sea levels rising was still one of the warmest three years on record. The data in this report should alarm us all. 2020 was 1.2 degrees Celsius hotter than pre-industrial times. We are getting dangerously close to the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit that was set by the scientific community. We are on the verge of the abyss. Did he say that? So why did the slowdown? Oh, let's say that, for, for lack of, for, 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 to save time. Did he say with his own mouth that we are on the urge of the abyss? Or a stupidious crisis? Did he say that? Are these current events fulfilling what the servant of the Lord says? And that we should, as God people, take the present time, current event, as something for us to look upon. That we may understand what, brethren? The spiritual clock of the world. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? Am I ready? This is the question to ask. 2020. This is the question to ask now, brethren. Let me tell you something. If the prophecies were important in the time of John, are they not more important in our time? Are they not more important in our time? And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to give you two verses. You see, as you go in there, John, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, and the, rest, and the next one will be in Revelation chapter 10. Remember, Daniel received messages from who? We are studying in the, the book of Daniel, you must know. Who brought the messages to Daniel? Really? Mm -hmm. The angel Gabriel... Yes or no? Then Gabriel told Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, shut up the book. Did he say that? Then he said, knowledge will increase and people will go to and fro to find the knowledge. Now in Revelation chapter 10, the book is what? Open. Now I want to I give a disclosure there. I know many People use the word knowledge will increase to praise the, 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 the progress in technology, the progress in other things. Yes or no? And I heard people say that. But brethren, let me tell you something. They are missing the mark. Because nothing in the book of Daniel primarily talk about progress in technology. It talks about progress, knowledge increase in the word of God. In the word of God. Let's go to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 12, brethren. Let's confirm this. Let's see that. Verse 4, he said, But thou, O Daniel, shut up, shut up the words and seal the book, even... To the time of the end. In other, in other words, from the time Daniel received the message and he closed the book, that book will remain closed until when? Until the time of the end. What is the content of this book? Prophecies. Prophecies. The book of Daniel. Is there in the book of Daniel anything relating to advancement in technology? Now, you can also say that. I understand that. But primarily, the book has the word of God in it. And the end time message for our time. Then 
Gabriel says, shut up this book. If you want to use this to say, God says knowledge will be increased, I'm okay with you. But primarily, this verse is talking about spiritual knowledge, biblical knowledge, knowledge and prophecy. Let me give you an example. When Miller used Daniel 9, the book of Daniel, he studied it verse by verse. Did, did his knowledge increase in the word of God? Was he able to preach about the second coming of Christ? Did he change men's heart and make tavern, convert taverns into um, uh, um, place of worship? Did he, did he do that? When, when he opened this book, his knowledge increased. Then he was able to preach it to people and they saw their needs. This we find it in Revelation chapter, chapter 10. Look at this, brethren. Let's go to Revelation, Revelation chapter 10. The same book now, the same book now, the same book, it says now in verse 4, and when the seven thunders had uttered their voice, I was about to write, to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those, seal up those things which the seven thunder altered and write them not. Is it the same thing? And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear unto him that, he, that, that live forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things that are therein that there should be time no longer. Now in the verse, in verse 9, when John received this book, the, the, the angel says, eat it. And he said, it will be sweet in your mouth and bitter in your, body, in your belly, but nevertheless, you need to prophesy again. Prophesy again? Is that advancement in technology? Advancement in the knowledge of, the, of God's words? But look at this now. They have a timeline that ended when, brethren? Mm. What is the longest time prophecy in the Bible? 2,200 days prophecies. Starting when? Finish, finishing when? 1844. Precisely October 22nd, 1844, and God says, after that day, there, in, there is no more time prophecy. Look to what? To current events. So if this was important for John the Baptist to preach the gospel, for Jesus to preach the gospel, for the disciples to preach the gospel, for them to understand Biblical prophecy, biblical secrets, is it more important for us to know about prophecies and the current event that we may see where we are in this world that is perishing? But look at this now, brethren. Now what I'm about to do, I'm about to do what we call a type of study, which is topology. What is topology? It's when we study type in the Bible. What is that? You take one event in the past and you compare it with another event and we call this style of learning topology. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Because in Daniel chapter 9, there was a preparation for God's people before the first coming of Jesus. Are you with me now? Before the first coming of Jesus. Now, since Jesus will return the second time, there must also be what, brethren? A preparation for God's people. Before we go study that, let's read this quotation. It says, the world is no more ready to credit the message for this time 
then were the Jews to receive the Savior's warning concerning Jerusalem. Come when it may, the day of God will come unaware to the ungodly. When life is going on, in its on, on varying round, when men are observed in pleasure, in business, in traffic, in money-making, in enlightenment, and the people are, are lulled in false security, then, as the midnight thief steals within the, the ungodly dwelling, so shall sudden destruction come upon the careless and ungodly, and they shall not escape. Careless? You did not take time to look at what? At the way marks of the second coming of Christ. Because time no longer, no more time prophecy, we have to look to what? To current events. Now let's use the preparation of the Jews before the first coming of Jesus as a type of our preparation for the second coming of Christ. Are you ready to study with me? Yes. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Let's read from verse 24 to verse 25. Look at this brethren, it says now, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Verse 25. Therefore, therefore, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commitment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the world even in what, brethren? In trouble lost time. We're going to use the preparation of the Jews before the first coming of Jesus as a type of our preparation for the second coming of Christ. Now, let's, let's read this carefully now, brethren. Let's see. They have now, they have now to end sin. Do you see that in verse 24? If you don't see it, I can advance, brethren. What, what, what was the message of Gabriel when he came to explain the, the, the vision to Daniel? What did he say? To finish the transgression. What does that mean, brethren? What is, what is transgression? Sin. Sin is the transgression of God's law. So if Gabriel says to finish the transgression is what? To put an end to sin. Now, Gabriel knows that people will not understand that. Daniel, Gabriel put a second emphasis. He says, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. No, no. And to make an end of sins. Because he knows people will say, he doesn't say sins. Gabriel did not let them can say the word of God. He explained what it means to finish the transgression. To finish the transgression means what, brethren? To make an end of sin. And to make reconciliation for iniquity. And to bring up the vision and prophecy. And to anoint the most holy. Brethren, look at this now. Look at this now. This Jesus now urge us when we were when he was on, in, on earth to be perfect like his father to put an end of sin let's go to Matthew chapter 5 this was part of the first message of Jesus 
Let's go to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, verse 8. His first message to the Jews, Jesus says in verse 8, Blessed, blessed are the pure in heart. For what? For they shall see, see God. In other words, if you are not pure in heart, there's no way that you cannot see who? Cannot see God. What is our ultimate goal, brethren? Our ultimate goal is to see God. What is the requirement? The requirement is for us to be pure. Pure in heart. Let's see another one. Let's go to Matthew 19, verse 21. 19, Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. It says now, Jesus said unto him, the young ruler, he says, if thou wilt be perfect, you see our word, pure in heart, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come and follow me. In other words, for you to have purity of heart, you must surrender everything to Jesus and not take anything for you. Anything that you cherish more than Jesus will prevent you to do what? To come and follow him. Now, let me ask you a question. Is it possible to have victory over sin? You say, yes, but I understand that. Do you have a practical way to do it? Unless, yes, through Jesus. Unless you have a practical way to do it, it's just an ideal, not a reality. Let me give you a practical way to do it. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. There is a practical way to leave sin alone. And brethren, I'm, I'm, I'm battling with all my heart to come to that level. Battling to, to all my heart to come to that level. And I know that God one day, what did I say? God one day will give you and I that precious pearl, which is living on earth without sin. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, let's start from verse 6. It says, brethren, whosoever abideth in him. I'm giving you the solution now. Whosoever abideth in him, sin not. So what did Jesus ask? What did Jesus ask his disciples to do? He asked them to abide in him. So what did it, what did it mean when he says now, to put an end to sin and to make reconciliation with iniquity. What does that mean? To abide in him. In other words, to anoint him as their, as their king. As their king. This was the preparation of ancient Israel. Should it not be also our preparation? Yes, it is. I'm giving you practical, practical steps to have victory over sins, that what happened to the Jews who did not make a covenant with Jesus, that this does not happen to us. Let's keep on reading. He said, whosoever abided in him, sinat, whosoever sinat, had not seen him, neither know him. Little children, let no man deceive you. Deceive you in what? By telling you that you cannot have victory over sin. You see that, brethren? Let no man do what, brethren? Deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is what? Righteous, even as he is righteous. Verse 8. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now verse 9. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Verse 6 to verse 9. It says now, Whosoever is born of God, do not commit sin. So what was the call of Gabriel 
to the people of God in Daniel 9, verse 24. What was the call? The call is to be born again. Whosoever is born of God, do not commit sin, for his seed we meaneth in him. And he cannot sin because he is what, brethren, born of God. So what was the preparation for ancient Israel? That they may do what? Be born again. Was it possible? How is it possible to allow Jesus to live in you? My friend, this is the mystery of the gospel. Christ in us, Gentiles. You understand that? That's the capability. That's what Jesus does for us when he died on the, cry, on the cross. Giving us access to live with him in us. Is someone tell you that it is impossible to stay without sin? What would you say to that person today? It is possible. I'm battling with God just like Jacob did, that I may have him living in me. And the day that I am born again, that day, I will sin no more. And you know, brethren, for, for us to not sin, Jesus must declare it. Jesus will say, he that is holy, be holy still. He that is righteous, be righteous still. That's how you stop sinning. Jesus must declare it to you. But how, what will make it declare it for you? While you are doing what the world is doing? No, while you are striving to observe his commandments. Then Jesus seeing your, 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 your supplication, your misery, not misery, but what your effort to live righteously, Jesus said, you are qualified. Let me now enable you to stop sinning. You didn't say amen. You, you're not waiting for that time. You know, in other words, you're not striving, brethren. Let me say, if you are studying hard for, for an exam, would you not expect an A? What if the teacher gives you a C minus, what would you do? And you know all your answers were okay. What would you do? You will complain. So now if Jesus does not pronounce that on you, and you know, even though our righteousness is like what? But you know Jesus is a righteous judge. For those who overcome, what did he say? I will give them access to sit on the throne as I sat down, I settled down with, on the throne of my father. But look at this now. Let's turn, our, turn, turn the page to verse 18. Well, these are beautiful words, but the practical way to have Jesus live in us is in verse 18. Verse 18 says, my little children, let us not love in word. Hmm. Are you with me now? Let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. That's how you have victory over sins. You don't love God in word. Oh, I love Jesus. Neither you say it with your mouth using your tongue. But in your action and in your deed, you reveal to the world that you truly love Jesus. If you love me, what do you do? You keep my commandments. Do you see action and deed in it? This is not words, brethren. Then verse 19 says, And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. You see that, brethren? God will know those he will pronounce on the word of living sin forever. Then verse 21, beloved, if our, no, 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 verse 22, and, 
in whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You see how you get Victor Versin? You do God's commandments. You ask him to give you Victor Versin. And the Bible says he will give you what you ask. Because you do his commandments. Now, is it possible to have Victor Versin? Did I show you how to have Victor Versin? Is this practical godliness? Because verse 3, verse 6 to verse 9 are words. Possibility. But verse 9, 18 to verse 22 is the how to become victorious over sin. Victorious over sin. So the children of Israel had to do what, brethren? They had to have victory over sins. He says... Supreme love for God and unselfish love for one another. This is the best gift that our Heavenly Father can bestow. This love is not an impulse. In other words, something that we feel. Victory over sin is not something that we feel. It's not an impulse, but a divine principle, a permanent power. Amen? Then it says... The unconsecrated heart cannot originate or produce it. Only in the heart where Jesus reigns is it found. We love him because he loves us. The Bible says he loves us first. Then it says, in the heart of renewed by divine grace, love is the ruling principle of action. Is love is the ruling of your action, will you break the Ten Commandments of God? No. It modifies the character. Govern the impulses. Controls the passions. And enables the affections. This love, cherished in the soul, sweetens the life and sheds a refining influence on all around. John strove to lead the believers to understand the exalted privileges that would come to them through the exercise of the spirit of love. If you love me, you do what? You keep my commandment. When you keep the commandments of God, you can now have victory over sin because when you ask him for this favor, Jesus will give it to you. Then it says, brethren, this redeeming power filling the heart would control every other motive and raise its possessors, possessors above the corrupting influences of the world. And as this love was allowed full sway and became the motive power of the life, in the life, their trust and confidence in God and, and his dwelling with them would be complete. When, when we see completion in the Bible, does that make, does that not make you perfect? Completion means perfect. Seven is a number of completion, also the number of perfection. So when the dwelling of Jesus is complete in you, you completely reflect his image then you will live without sin. Now, in Daniel 9, in Dan, let's go in Daniel 9, I'm showing you practical preparation for the second coming of Christ. And I did not leave my theme. My theme is prophecies, way marks, the way marks, Daniel chapter 9, let's go there. Daniel chapter 9. You can keep your finger in Daniel chapter 9 because we're going to go to and fro. From Daniel 9. Let me, put, let me put this there so I don't have to look a lot. Let's go there. It said now, look at this now. After they make an end, while they're making an end to sin, he says to bring everlasting prophecy, righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy. Did Gabriel tell them? To pay attention to prophecies. 
Now, let me ask you a question. Does, does, do we find a sealing message also in prophecy? To, to seal up what, brethren? To seal up the vision in what? In what, brethren? In prophecy. Let's, let's turn our Bible to Luke. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Let's see what Jesus says to those who are not paying attention to prophecies. Luke chapter 12, verse 55. Verse 54, it says, And he said also to the people, Jesus talking to them, he says, When he see a cloud rise out of the west. West? Hmm. Straightway, you say, there come a shower, so it is. You see how people understand prophecies? Do, did they see the did they see did did they see the rain yet? The rain yet? When Jesus said that, has has the rain come already? No, you're not reading. You're not reading. They said you see clouds forming in the west. Then you say it will rain. So it is. That means when you said it, rain that did not come yet. But because you look at the sign of the time. You know exactly when you see cloud forming from the west, there will be rain. Surely it rain. 55. And when he said a soft wind blow, he said there will be heat and it cometh to pass. In other words, Jesus is saying, why can't you not believe in my second coming? Why can't you not believe that I'm, I am the Messiah? Because you see all the signs. Then it says, he hypocrites. He can discern the face of the sky and of the earth. But how is it that you do not discern this time? What is this time? This time? What did, what did not Jesus say the time? If he had said the time, did he, did he had, would he have made um, a grammatical error? No. The time. Look at it. Let's read it again. Let's read it again. If Je Let's read that verse and see if Jesus would have made a grammatical error if he said the time. Look at this. He says now, Ye hypocrite, you discern the face of the sky, and of the earth. But how is it you do not discern the time? Now the, the time. Now the people will say, what time? Jesus not wanting them to say what time. He said this time. This time. Which is his second coming. Brethren, what can we not understand? That the second coming of Christ is near. The only reason is because we are not watching to the way marks of the second coming of Christ. And because we're not watching to the way marks of the second coming of Christ, we also are not getting prepared. We also are not, our brethren, are not getting prepared. Look at this now. Let's turn our Bible to Daniel chapter 9. For first preparation, we need to put an end to sin. Did you see, did I see that? Did I show you that? Did I give you practical godliness also? Second preparation is what? It's to look to prophecies that we may know what? The spiritual clock of the world. Now Jesus will tell them, Gabriel, Jesus via Gabriel will also tell them that while you are preparing for the first coming of Christ, you will face your enemies. In other words, repairing the walls of your life will make your enemy come to hinder you in your pursuit of sanctification. Let's read this. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Verse 25 now, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem 
unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, and two is called, and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous time. Let me make this now um, close to us. In other words, when we take time, when we take the time, or in other words, when we decide to start, to start building our spiritual life, When we take the decision to serve God, when we take the decision to observe the Ten Commandments, we will do it in troublous time. Trouble will come into our path. The enemy of your soul will not allow you to make an end to sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to anoint Jesus as king in your life, to look and observe and, and, and be aware of the prophecies of this time. You're doing all this righteous thing, and you, and, and you think that Satan will sit on a chair and just let you do what you will. Gabriel told them, when Atar's excess will give the order to rebuild Jerusalem, the enemy of God, your enemy, the enemy of Judah, will hinder the work. In other words, Satan will hinder the work of sanctification in you. But now can we find strength to keep on building our body temple? The answer is yes. Look at this now. Look at this now. I don't want to lose you here. We are about to find what, who in the past hindered the Israelite to build the wall of Jerusalem. Once we understand this, we will be able to understand who will, at the end of time, hinder us also to build our body temple to receive Jesus to receive victory over sins. You want to see it? Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7 and, and verse 8. Nehemiah. Nehemiah is in the Old Testament. All right. Right after Ezra, you find Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 4. I want, you, I want you to read this. I'm going to take some time to explain that to you. This is very important. And as you go in there, let me show you what, what we'll see. We will see that, brethren, those who will hinder us to find righteousness, to live a victorious life over sin with Jesus, are those who know the truth but refuse to accept it and now because they refuse to accept it, they became your enemy. We also see that the leaders who will, who will place the decree, some of them, for the mark of the beast, in other words, to force us to worship God on Sunday instead of on Sabbath, some of them know the truth. Because of unrighteous motive, wicked interest, personal interest, they hide the truth in you, for you, from you. Let's read Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7 and verse 8. It says, but it came to pass that when Simbalat, are the Bible now, is the Bible now describing people? That Simbalat and Tobiah, and, and the Arabian, and the Ammonite, and the Ash, Ashdodite, Ashdodite, heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up, and that the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very much what? Wroth. Mean they were mad, angry. Verse 8. 
and conspire, all of them, to gather, to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. In other words, brethren, God says to Israel, put an end to sin. Be aware of prophecies and current events. Start building the walls of Jerusalem. In other words, start being again a people because they were in slavery. It's the same call for us to put an end to sin, look at prophecies, and then guard our body temple, building walls against us, around us, that Satan cannot lead us away from God. Did you remember what Satan told Jesus about Job? He said, you place a hedge around him. This is why he's serving you. He's not serving you for naught. Since you do good for him, now he serves you. So in other words, we must build a hedge around us. Now, when Satan sees that we are building that hedge around us, he goes now and attacks us. He will not do it personally, but he will have agents, just like Sembalat, Tobiah, and the rest, to hinder this work in you. Are you following until now? Now, we want to know who are these people? Who are these people? You want to know, brethren? Let's go to Israel chapter 4. Just the chapter prior. Israel chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4. It says, verse 1. Look at this now. He said, Now when the adversary of Judah and Benjamin, this is in the context when the kings, the three kings, first Cyrus, secondly Darius, thirdly Artaxerxes, they were giving the commandment for the Israelites to leave Babylon to go build Jerusalem. Our goal is to leave Babylon and to go to heavenly Jerusalem. These men came as enemy of Judah and Benjamin to hinder them. Look at this. Now it says, And when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity building, builded the temple Unto the Lord, God Israel. Let's stop there. Should we not build a temple to God? Our body? So now, in other words, when the enemy, our enemy, starts seeing us building our body as an acceptable temple to God, their eyes will be on us to handle us. Then it says, brethren, verse 2, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of their fathers and said unto them, let us build with you. Now, be, now, now I'm serious now. I only have 16 minutes. He said, let us build with you. In other words, let us prepare together the second coming of God. Let us prepare together this body for the second coming of Christ. Do you see there? Then it says, brethren, then it says, brethren, let us be with you, for we seek your God. In other words, we know your God. We know your God. Look at this now. It says now, we know your God as you do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Ash. Shahadan, king of Assur, which brought us hither. Now, we need to make some history now to know who brought this per these people and where did he bring them. Are you with me, brethren? Did I bore you yet? All right. Now, look at this now. If you have references or Concordance in your Bible. Do you see any verses? Do you see any verse from by verse by by verse two? Any reference? Second Kings, what brethren? Chapter seventeen, verse twenty-four. 
In other words, if we read 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 24, we can see who these people are. These people who came to hinder the work of rebuilding Jerusalem. In other words, these people who will prevent us to rebuild our body temple. To have victory over sins. And secondly, to prevent us to see the prophecies of the world. Do you want to know who are they? Who they, who, who they are? All right, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 17. Hmm. What did he say? We must start. We must start in verse 24. All right. It says, brethren, we're going to have a history class right now. Take your time. Let's read together. It says, And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon. From who? Babylon. And from Kutha, and from Hava, Ava, and from Hamath, and from Sepharvaim, and placed them in the city of Samaria. At that time, the city was a city where the Jews used to live. Are you with me? But they went into captivity because of what Jeremiah said, that because they're not following the word of God, and they are troubling down of, upon the Sabbath of the Lord, Lord say, I will bring what? To Babylon. Now, this, the reading that we're doing will explain that to us. I don't want to go over my, over my, over my thought. Let's, let's read. Let's, 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 let's allow the Bible to teach us history. It says, now verse 25, As so it was in the beginning of their dwelling there, that they fear not the Lord. Are you with me? Who, who are these people who are not fearing, fearing God? Those coming from where? Babylon, who came to dwell now where? In, no, in Samaria, also in the land of Israel. All right. Now, look at this now. So, and so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them who slew some of them. That's Solomon. In other words, what does lion represent? Prophecy. In prophecy? Babylon. So when we don't do God's commandment, who will eat us? Babylon will eat us afresh. Let's keep on reading now. Wherefore, they speak to the king of Assyria, saying, the nation which thou has removed and placed in the city of Samaria, know not the manner of what? Of the God of the land. That's history. Therefore, he has sent lions among them. And behold, they slay them because they know not the manner of the God of the, of the land. These are Babylonians because the land was empty after they went to Babylon. So now the king brought them from Babylon to go and sojourn where? In Samaria. But when they came there, they start doing their own things. And they did not fear God. Because of that, God sent their own nation, lion, lions, to eat them. But look what they do, or what they did. Verse 27. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Now, did the king provide someone to teach them about the Ten Commandments of God? 
to teach them how to worship God. But remember, I told you, those are the same men who came to hinder their work. And this is why in, in, in Israel chapter 4, they said, we know your God. We know how to serve your God. Because we do the same sacrifice unto him. Why? Because they were taught by an Israelite priest how to worship God. Yeah, are you with me now? But these men are called who? The enemy of Judah. The enemy of Benjamin. In other words, the men that, are, that would be our enemies at the end of time, they will, these men will know about the true worship. You're not with me. And I'm talking about leaders now. I'm not talking about the people. Because Sembalat and Tobiah, they were leaders. They even sent a letter to the king that they may hinder the work of rebuilding Jerusalem. Are we not in the process of rebuilding our heart to Jesus? To rebuild our body temple to Jesus? Now we find enemies of the cause. Hindering the work of God. And the Bible is telling us these men were educated as Seventh-day Adventists. As Jews. I'm going to read verse 27 again. It says, Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry hither one of the priests whom he brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let them teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria, Samaria came and dwell in Bethel, and taught them how they what? Should fear God. History, brethren. History. We need to read our Bibles. Take time to read our Bibles. Then it says, verse 28. Hmm. How be it every nation made gods of their own. Now the Bible says, how come? How be it means how come? After they were taught by, these, by the priests that they are making idols on their own. And because of lack of time, let us read verse 34. The Bible says, unto this day. What does it mean unto this day? In the present time. Unto this day, they do after the former man manners. What are the former manners? Idolatry. What they used to do before they sent uh, Israelite priests to teach them the manner of God. The Bible says until today, they still do according to the former manners. Now, if we want to put this now into our, our time, who will this man represent? Hmm? Who they will represent? Men who are instructed into the word of God. Men who know the truth, but refuse to apply it. Keep on living the way they used to live. They keep on doing until now. But when they see you now preparing yourself to receive God, they erect themselves as your enemies. In other words, you will build this body temple to receive Jesus in troublous time. In troublous time. These men are men who know about the Ten Commandments of God. These men also represent Babylon. Where do they come, brethren? They come from Babylon. 
was, was Rome at the beginning, right, the scent of Rome, righteous to God. Paul says to the scent living in Rome, but by and by what happened to them? They lowered the standard of God and brought up the, the, the fake Sabbath, which is Sunday, and make people worship on Sunday rather than worshiping on what? On Saturday. I'm going to give you an example. If you go to the catechism of the, of the Catholics, they will say to you that they are the one who deliberately change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. In other words, they know that the day of the Lord is what? Is the Sabbath? How do they know that? They must have been instructed by to know that the true day to worship is on the Sabbath. But since they want to continue to their former ways, <clears throat> what do they do? What do they do? They change the word of God. Did the, did the Bible prophesy about that? Daniel 7 verse 25. How do they do that? They erase the second commandment and split it and split into what? And split into what? The, the last commandment into. They split it into. They split it into. The second commandment, thou shalt not worship any graven image, and the ten one they divide it into. Did, did, does, does, did, do they know the word of God? But they choose to go to what? To the former manners. And now they erect themselves as God's enemies. And if they are the enemies of God, they are also your enemies. Why? Because you want to stay faithful to God. Do you understand the preparation? The same preparation that the Israel had had, we have it also. Now let's go, brethren, to Israel chapter 4. I just did the history with you. What did Israel tell them? Did Israel allow them to work with them? Did Israel allow to have ecumenism? Oh, man. Ecumenism with them. No. Did he allow them to have church on Saturday and church on Sunday? No. To have their priest team to be in their church? No. To have priests coming and preach and preach on Saturday? The Bible said we have nothing, nothing to do with you. You want to read that? Verse 3. I, Israel chapter 4, verse 3, it says, but Zerubbabel and Joshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing, nothing and nothing and nothing to do with you, to do with us, to build a house to our God. For we, dealt, we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as the king Cyrus, king of Persia, had commanded. So Zerubbabel says, listen, we are not mingling together because all that you want to do is to hinder my spiritual work with Jesus. Have nothing to do with you. Brethren, when you have Bible study, don't you ever hear people say, we serve the same God? Those who go to church on Sunday? We are serving the same God? Brethren, for those who are sincere, what I'm about to say is not for them. Because the Bible says, men being deceived and deceiving others. They see it under the mouth of the pastor. They are deceived. But now if you come to them and show them that Saturday is the day of worship, they say, no, since my grandma was a Baptist, a Sunday worshiper, I want to remain like that. That's not your problem now. But for these men who are telling you that they all worship the same God as you 
and they want to participate in your program, be your leaders, your song leaders, your pianists, your director choir, choir director, we as a church should say to them, we have nothing to do with you. We will have our service by ourselves. The, the pianist will be ours from ours. The, the, the song leaders will be Seventh-day Adventists. The pastor to preach will be a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. There's nothing to do with you. Because all you want to do is to hinder my members, my church, to build this body temple that Jesus is waiting for. So what must be our preparation, brethren? It's to make an end to sin. Look at prophecies as waymarks. And don't take any part, any spiritual part, with the heathens. Are you with me now? Yeah. Brethren, I have a lot. But I cannot pass my time. Cannot pass my time. There is a preparation for us to die God's people. Do you agree with me? And for us to do it, we will need to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus promised to the disciple. Let's go there. My last verse. I had to jump to my last verse. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus says, but he shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is coming upon you. And you shall be witness unto both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. Samaria, this main of Babylon. You didn't catch Samaria. That's, that, that's why I could not stand before I read this. Jesus says you will go to where? What happened to, to, to the land of Samaria? Main of? Main of? Oh, I lost, I lost 30 minutes of my time. Men of Babylon came to the land of Samaria, and though they were taught to serve God the, 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 the right way, they kept their old manner. God says, you will go to Samaria. What happened to Jesus when he met the woman in Samaria? How many God were she serving? You know these husband, husbandmen, the husbandmen. Jesus was talking to the whole land of Samaria. God says, where are your husbands? He could not say. Jesus is the husband of the church. She said, I have six husbands. I have five husbands, even the one now. Jesus says, the one that you have right now is not yours. I must be your husband. Jesus was the seventh husband. Completion. So must we not go to Samaria and teach those Babylonians to receive the seventh husband, which is Jesus? We need to receive power from the Lord, brethren. And we must do this preparation Put an end to sin, understand prophecy, and have nothing to do with these heathens. Then it says, there is now need of earnest working men and women who will seek for the salvation of souls. In other words, who will go to Samaria. For Satan as a powerful general for Satan, as a powerful general, has taken the field. The field of God, Satan has taken it. How did he take it, brethren? How does he take it? With these men who know the truth, 
But they refuse to preach. You know, I know a, a Haitian, a Haitian Baptist pastor. His wife is a Seventh-day Adventist. He's still preaching. He has, a, he has one, of, one of the biggest church in this area. One day his wife told him, hey, when will you tell your member <clears throat> about the truth? When will you teach them about the Sabbath? When he saw the tithe, the tithe and the offering, his position in, 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 in the Haitian society, he refused until today to teach them the truth. And how many people is going to their grave Christless? Is he not like one of these men who came from Babylon? But who received the, 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 the doctrine, but went to their old manners and do it until today. We need to have the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to put an end to sin, understand prophecies, and don't take any spiritual part or any part with these heathens that we may go to Samaria. And those they are teaching that Saturday is not the day of rest, but Sunday is the day of rest by the power that gives the Holy Spirit to, 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 to pluck out the soul from the fire of damnation and to bring them to Jesus. Look at this now. It says, brother. It says, it says, it says, it says. And in this last remnant of time, he's working through all conceivable method to close the door against light that God would come to his people. He is sweeping the whole world into his rank and the few who are faithful to God's requirements are the only ones who can ever withstand him and even these he's trying to overcome. What must we do to stop Satan to overcome us? Put an end to sin. Understand prophecy. And take no part, no part, with anything from the world. And now study the Bible that we may go to Samaria and grab from his hand those who are still worship on Sunday, who would be joyfully worship on Saturday when they know about the truth. Did you want once? Did you once worship on Sunday? Did someone grab you from their hands, bring you to the truth? Don't you want to do the same thing for Jesus? Brethren, we have work to do. There is a baptismal class by Brother Love. Contact him. It will give you that link. We must go and do evangelism every Saturday. We are making plans for this. I take the permission from Brother Love to say it because of the message. We need to go and do evangelism every Saturday. People from Samaria are waiting for us to teach them the truth, to grab them from these pastors who know that Saturday is the Sabbath, but still keeping them in bondage because of tithes and offerings. And in the same current of ideas, on the, third, on the 23rd this month, we'll have a breast cancer health seminar. We are doing this because this is the right arm of the gospel. But also we want them to bring, we want to bring them where? Into the cross. In other words, after we have this seminar, we need workers. People that will join me, Brother Ralph, Brother Anthony, Brother Brian, Brother Eve, the deacons, to join together that we may form an army to call these people back to bring them to the line where we have power of prayer, to pray with them, to suffice into their, need, their needs. And now, 
by showing them love, they will also find the love of Jesus. Do you want to join us? Do you want to join us? And then you know the regular program. I want to pray with you today. Those who have been touched by the sermon, would you like to join me in prayer? That you may follow the step of preparation, put an end to sin, understand prophecy, and know Jesus in your life. Then, get the strength from Jesus, even though these Samaritan will come to hinder you. That Jesus may give you power not only to win your soul from them, but to preach the message of salvation to Samaria. Let's pray.